Today's scripture passage is um, Mark 11, verses 1 through 10. You're invited to turn there or follow along on a screen. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This is God's word. Thanks, Nancy. When we reach this particular part in the Gospel of Mark, Mark's focus shifts and his emphasis on what we call Passion Week begins. Do you know what Passion Week is? Tell me if you know what Passion Week is. What is it? It's the week that leads up to and culminates with with the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we call Easter. Yeah, Passion Week. And, it, and it's interesting that it's called Passion because the root of the word has to do with suffering and, and pain. And so this is Christ's Passion Week. Now what's interesting is that from this point forward in Mark, everything that Mark has to talk about happens within seven days. And you're only in chapter 11. And there are 16 total chapters. So you've been through 10 chapters of Mark. Now here at the beginning of chapter 11, everything gets compressed. Okay? It's very interesting. And one thing this is telling you is that the passion events, the week of Christ's passion, are extraordinarily important to Mark. Matter of fact, some people like to say that Mark is a passion narrative with an extended 10-chapter intro. Which, so think about it. He spent 10 chapters on almost three full years. And now he's going to spend six chapters or seven chapters on seven days. That tells you something about what Mark deemed to be important as the Spirit of God was leading him to pen the memoirs of the Apostle Peter. And that's what you have in Mark's Gospel. Now today's passage, which is chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, is a passage that is typically preached on what day of the year? Palm Sunday, which is yet three weeks ahead for us. So we're a little bit out of sync, but you know what? I didn't care. And I actually thought, you know what, I want to take things in the order in which they come as much as is possible for us, barring sickness and that kind of thing. And when this passage is addressed, it will not be Palm Sunday, but I thought maybe that will cause it to stand out a little bit more, almost like you're going to have a Christmas message in the middle of July. Because sometimes when you get away from all of the extracurriculars, you might be able to hear a little bit differently. So this is a Palm Sunday text which we're treating a little bit early. Now, what happens in these verses, I have to tell you, is extraordinarily complicated. It, this one particular event, what's happening here, is jam-packed, and it's so much so that it's hard for me to even know where to begin. Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem, the ancient city of Jerusalem, which is still there, and he rides down the slope of the Mount of Olives, on the colt of a donkey and a massive throng of people are excited and celebrating his arrival and they're attributing, attributing to him messianic ascriptions and Jesus allows it to go on and, and other people are angry and it's a very complicated thing and it makes you ask what in the world is going on in the midst of this bedlam? 
Well, thus far in Mark, one thing that we have seen, we've seen a lot of things, but one of the things that we have seen is that there was a lot of confusion amongst the masses and even amongst Jesus' closest followers about what was the nature of this kingdom that Jesus had come to announce and into which he was inviting people. What is that kingdom? What's it like? Is this a kingdom that looks like every other kingdom that we've ever known on the face of the earth? Or is, is there something different about it? People struggled to understand what Jesus was presenting in this kingdom. And nothing will quite so vividly show the uniqueness of this kingdom of God that Jesus was announcing as will the events that unfold over the next seven days of Jesus' life. And it shows you what kind of a king he is. And it shows you what kind of values hold sway in a kingdom where God truly reigns. Now, one thing that stood out to me as I thought over this passage over the last week is that I see here, and I want you to try to hang on to this phrase, I see here a divine choreography. A divine choreography. It really is genius. And I want to start by pointing this out. The timing of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. God has selected what season? Passover season for Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the events that follow it in those seven days. Passover. Timing is everything. Think about it. Passover, the once annual celebration of Jewish deliverance from bondage in Egypt. Passover, the high holy day of remembrance of lambs that were slaughtered for the lives of God's people. Passover, the focal point of the entire Jewish calendar year. Passover, the event that more than any other thing highlights Jewish identity. And Jewish pilgrims from all over the world of that day were at that very time flooding into Jerusalem for a week-long celebration of Passover. So as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on this day, He's not the only one coming into Jerusalem. Throngs of worshipers. And I want you to think about, uh, what is it, uh, the way Muslims look at the, the pilgrimage to Mecca. That would be much the feeling of Jewish pilgrims returning to Jerusalem for Passover. And as Jesus rides down the slope of the Mount of Olives, imagine what he sees as the city of Jerusalem is overflowing with pilgrims who are coming into town, looking for lodgings, setting up their own lodgings. And all of these pilgrims are filled with fever-pitched ultra-Zionism, nationalism of the highest order. Now, there's a quote here that I wanted to share with you. It comes from R.T. Franz in his book called I Came to Set the Earth on Fire. And he describes Jerusalem at Passover and perhaps this particular Passover when Jesus came in. Jerusalem, quite a small town by modern standards, perhaps 30,000 inhabitants, was swollen to six times its normal population at Passover time. The city itself could not hold them. And they filled the surrounding villages while large numbers set up tents outside the city. Picture a tent city outside because Jerusalem won't hold them. It's a walled city. Jesus comes down the slope of, of the Mount of Olives, and, and there are people setting up tents, and maybe people who have already got them set up, and it's crowded, and he sees all of this, and he comes down into the city of Jerusalem. Try and imagine it. Now, before we go further, I want to try to help us to remember something. I want you to remember the courage of Jesus at this moment. Because we have pointed out that three times he has extremely precisely told his disciples what awaited him in Jerusalem. And it was not good. Well, it's good for us, but it wasn't pleasant. It was going to be awful for him. 
he told his disciples, be aware, understand that when I am in Jerusalem, I am going to be betrayed. I am going to be spat upon. I'm going to be mocked. I will be flogged within an inch of my life and then executed on a cross. And three days later, I will rise. Imagine the courage of Jesus as he comes down the slope and he sees the city and he sees it overrun with pilgrims, knowing what's happening to him when he arrives in Jerusalem. And not only do I want you to remember the courage of Jesus, I want you to remember the commitment of Jesus to the fulfillment of what he had come to do. Because it was for this that he was born. It was for this that he had come. Mark 11, verses 1 through 6 says, and I read, As they approached Jerusalem, Jesus and his disciples, and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Pause. What are those towns? Well, basically they are bedroom communities, much like Lusby and St. Leonard might be to Prince Frederick, or like Dunkirk and Forestville might be to Washington, D.C., but a little closer in because they didn't have interstates. Okay, so these are the on the outskirts of, of the region, and, and, and as Jesus approaches them, here's what happens here. He sends two of his disciples, verse 2, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there. Notice the detail here. This is eyewitness detail, Peter's memoirs, okay? You'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're doing this, say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway, and as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. Now look on the screen, picture. What do you see? Quick, a tree. Okay, how many of you saw the lion and the, the gorilla first? Okay, this is kind of, these exercises are always interesting. I think most people, well, maybe I assume this because this is what I see first. I saw the tree first. And I had to look at it a little bit to see the, the, the animals. Okay, but different people look at it and different things stand out more vividly to individual people, which is fascinating. Well, this passage has a similar thing to it here. Because some people, when they read this passage about the cult and the disciples being sent and, and Jesus telling them to untie it and bring it here and people intervening, wait, well, what are you doing? Where are you going with that cult? Well, the Lord needs it and he'll send it back here shortly. Okay, you can go. A lot of people look at that and they see what I would call arrangements having been made in advance by Jesus. And there's certainly nothing unspiritual about making arrangements in advance. That's probably a wise thing to do. I think the Proverbs would support the fact that that would be a wise way to live your life. You make provision for what may be ahead, knowing that you can't even control tomorrow. You, you can't even control your next breath. Nonetheless, you, a wise person makes provision for things. So there's nothing unspiritual about the fact that Jesus really did make arrangements with somebody for the loaning of this colt. Okay, But other people look at this very passage, and that's not what they see. They see the wild animals. You know, they see, What they're seeing is, is Jesus' foreknowledge and his irresistible will. No necessary arrangements having been made in advance. Jesus is predicting what's going to happen. The disciples are astonished to find it so. And the spoken word of the Lord Jesus causes people to bow and do what it is that he wants. So which do you see? You don't have to answer that question. I just want to tell you that those two things seem to be going on there. And depending on who you are, you may rest on one or the other. I will tell you this, that if you do see divine foreknowledge and an irresistible will, sovereign will, if you will, going on here, well, that certainly would not be inconsistent with what else you've seen of Jesus at other points in the gospel. So land on either side of the coin, it's all right with me. But there is that little bit of a tension going on when you look at this passage. I would also say this, though. you got to wonder what the point of recording all that almost 
irrelevant detail is if it isn't recorded simply because it was astonishing to the people who witnessed it. Probably Peter. He was probably one of those sent to get the donkey colt. Probably, because these are Peter's memoirs that Mark is penning. And it seems to have been amazing to him. That's why the detail is recorded here. That's what I would say. <clears throat> now, there's another divine manifestation here that is, I think, largely overlooked because we're so busy trying to figure out whether this is advanced planning or, or sovereign foreknowledge and etc. It's a little bit less obvious to us, but nonetheless, it's divine manifestation here. Did you catch the fact that this is what we might call today an unbroken cult? Mark does not highlight this. He doesn't make a big deal out of it. But other gospel writers do. Mark and Luke go out of their way to describe this young donkey as one which no one has ever ridden. Now, I'm very curious. Anybody here ever try to ride an unbroken colt? Whether it's a horse or whether it's a, a, a donkey. Has anybody ever tried to do that? I didn't figure that would be the case. I wondered if any of you have ever tried to break such an animal so that it could be ridden. I See, we're kind of at a loss to, to realize what an astonishing thing is happening here. Okay, animals that had not been broken don't take kindly to having somebody sit on them and ride them. Okay, that's not uh, an experience that I would advocate for you. You wind up with something broken, most likely. <laughs> yeah, and not the horse. <laughs> Very good. Somebody's paying attention here. So I think what you got here in a very understated way You've got Jesus doing something that's on a par with turning water into wine. Something that's on a par with speaking a word to a storm system and it listens to him. Jesus demonstrating a mastery over the created order so that it does what he wants it to do. And it's so understated here. But I do have to point out that I think this is why Mark actually bothers to tell us that the colt was previously unbroken, unridden. Why else do you point that out? But there's more going on with this whole animal thing, this whole colt of a donkey thing. Why a colt that has never been ridden? In my mind work this week, well... Do you realize that God brought forth the conception of Jesus in the womb of a virgin? Realize that in a week, Jesus' body without its life would be laid in the tomb of a man who was wealthy and in whom, in which tomb nobody had ever lain. And I wonder if there's not sort of like a poetic, almost parabolic theme going on here of things being set aside as designated for a holy and a specific purpose. So Jesus rides into town on a donkey miraculously that has never been ridden and he sits on it and he rides it into town and there's a theme it seems going on here again divine choreography it's going to circle around to this several times throughout the message. And now most preachers when they deal with this passage they're going to go here, so I, I won't disappoint. i got to go here, too. Why, why, why not a horse? Why, why a donkey? Why the cult of a donkey and not, not a horse? And I think there are obvious reasons. A horse is a show you know, of, of power and, and authority and conquest and, and aristocracy. But a donkey, a little donkey, it doesn't convey those things. It, it, it conveys you know, ideas like... Humility and peace and commonness. And again, I point out divine choreography. Is there something for us to learn about the nature of Jesus, the nature of our God, in the choice of an animal in, on which he rides into the city of Jerusalem? And I think the answer is yes. There are things to observe and to learn here. 
Now, before we move on from the choice of a donkey's colt as a vehicle for Jesus to enter Jerusalem, I, I, want, I want to say I would love to have been the people who loaned the donkey to Jesus. Wouldn't that be cool to have been the people who loaned that donkey to Jesus? If you remember the fact that even a cup of water given in his name will never lose its reward. And here is a person donating a donkey so that Jesus can ride into Jerusalem to the acclaim of a Jewish throng. It's pretty astonishing. And, and while you and I might not have a donkey to loan, can you not loan your car? Can, can you not loan your house to something that matters to Jesus? Can you, can you not donate your money? You know, it's, it's just a reminder that these smallest things matter. Whoever it was that loaned that donkey, we're talking about it. 2,000 years later, it's extraordinary. Something so small and yet so epic. Now, before we leave the donkey, as I said, I, I, I want you to think how sweet it would have been even for the donkey. I found a great little poem that was written in the early 1900s by a guy named G.K. Chesterton, who was just an astonishing, brilliant man, British man. And Chesterton wrote fiction, he wrote theology, he wrote poetry, he wrote social, cr cr social criticism and, and so forth. He, he, he wrote all kinds of things. But he wrote a poem in which this donkey is given a voice. And he looks back on the day that Jesus rode in on his back. And the poem is just great. I just wanted to share this with you. Chesterton writes, when fishes flew and forests walked and figs grew upon thorn, some moment when the moon was blood, then surely I was born, says the donkey, with monstrous head and sickening cry and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody on all four-footed things. The tattered outlaw of the earth, of ancient crooked will, starve, scourge, deride me, I am dumb, I keep my secret still. Fools, for I also had my day. My hour, I'm sorry. One far fierce hour and sweet. There was a shout about my ears and palms before my feet. Verses 7 through 10 say, They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord Yahweh. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So just what's going on there? A whole lot. And I want to approach this by breaking it down to a series of questions that I will pose to you and then briefly answer trying to find some logical way to break down everything that is involved in this complex situation. So here's the first question I want to present and to try to provide an answer for. So what is Jesus doing by entering into Jerusalem in this way? Why, why didn't he just stroll into town? What's going on here? Interesting choice, Jesus. Is there a reason for it? Well, 520 years before Christ was born, so about 550 years prior to the day on which this happened, there was a Jewish man who was used by God to communicate to the Jewish people about what God thought. He was a prophet, and his name was Zechariah. And on one occasion, well, many more occasions than one, but on one particular occasion, God was communicating through Zechariah about the time when God would send a king a deliverer, a Messiah to the Jewish people who would, who would bring in the reign of God and his people would be crowned as his people indeed. And how would that king come when that day arrived? Zechariah wrote about it, 520 B.C. And in Zechariah chapter 9, in your Bibles, in verse 9, you can read this. Here's what Zechariah wrote, and see if you don't see something vaguely familiar here. Zechariah wrote, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. 
See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a... I'm waiting. Donkey. On a colt. The foal of a donkey. So what is Jesus doing here? Again, Mark doesn't make a big deal out of this, but Matthew and John do as they record this event. Those two gospel writers tell us that Jesus is deliberately acting out the fulfillment of this Old Testament prophecy from the pen of Zechariah. Now, there is every indication that Jesus did a lot of this. In other words, Jesus made choices to behave in certain ways that were deliberately acting out the fact that he in person was fulfilling all that had been foretold. And it was as if Jesus, in making these choices, like choosing to ride into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey, he was saying to people, pay careful attention, you all. I am exactly what the prophets of old have anticipated and foretold. I am that which has been prophesied. Look no further. Now the second question, the one that follows logically, is this. Uh, do the crowds get it? Do the crowds recognize that this is indeed what Jesus is doing deliberately? And my answer is, you better believe it. You better believe they get it. Now, I want to give you a little bit of cultural background here because this helps what Jesus does here to stand out. A triumphal entry in the biblical era was nothing new. It was a phenomenon. In the biblical era, a triumphal entry was an honor that was granted to a Roman general who had won a complete and a decisive victory, having killed at least 5,000 enemy soldiers in the conquest. Note the criteria. And when the victorious general returned to Rome, an elaborate parade was given. Now, how would that parade unfold? What was involved in the parade? Well, listen closely, because I didn't put this on a slide. First of all, in the, pro in the process, in the procession came what we would call the spoils that were brought in and displayed. Look what we've captured. It was everything that was rich and valuable. These used to belong to other people. Guess whose they are now? They're ours. We have conquered. So the spoils come first in the procession. Next in the procession follow the prisoners who have been taken alive in the conquest. And they're brought in in such a way that shows that they have been subjugated, they've been dominated, they've been humbled, and they're in chains. Next would march in, unit by unit, the victorious army. And then finally, in sort of the climax of the procession, the general himself rides in, seated in a gold-gilded chariot, pulled by magnificent horses, while priests are burning incense in his honor, and the crowds are shouting his name in acclaim, and they are hailing him as a great hero. Now get this, the entire procession then runs its course in that order through the streets. Guess where it ends? It ends at the arena which is the designated terminus of the parade. And at the arena, some of those humiliated captives are taken in and they are made sport of by wild animals and killed. Much to the delight of a bloodthirsty crowd. Quite an exclamation point of what it means to conquer. Everybody understood a triumphal entry. Now, David Guzik, who provides a little handy and very useful biblical commentary online, Guzik said of Jesus' triumphal entry, he says, we call this event the triumphal entry, but it was a strange kind of triumph. If you spoke of Jesus' triumphal entry to a Roman, they'd have laughed at you. For them, this was just a Galilean peasant sitting on a few coats set on a pony. Do you see the contrast? 
Now, you've got to admit that Christ's entry into Jerusalem that day was a far cry from the traditional understanding of a triumphal entry. And yet, the nationalistic Passover Jewish crowd recognizes this as a messianic moment. Those people knew Zechariah chapter 9, let me tell you. And they knew precisely what Jesus was doing. How do I know that? That leads us right into the third question. What is the crowd's response? Fever-pitched, enthusiastic, messianic acclaim. Look at verses 8 through 10. Many people spread their cloaks in the road, while others spread branches they'd cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Yahweh. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Do you know what they're doing? They're quoting Psalm 118, verses 25 through 27. They're taking bits of the psalm and they're attributing them to Jesus. Here's what Psalm 118, verses 25 through 27 says. See if this doesn't seem familiar. Lord Yahweh, save us. Lord Yahweh, grant us success. By the way, you do know that that translates the word Hosanna, which you sang over and over again this morning, which is why we chose the song. That's the concept of Hosanna. Lord, save now. Save us. The psalm continues. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord Yahweh. From the house of the Lord Yahweh, we bless you. The Lord Yahweh is God, and he has made his light shine on us with bows in hand. Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. And so the people of Jerusalem, all of the pilgrims that have fled into town, are doing that precise thing. They are saying, this is our psalmic offering to you as we see you presenting yourself to us as the fulfillment of all of the prophecy of Messiah. They're dramatizing it as they welcome him. Bob Deffenbaugh also provides some helpful online commentary. He writes on his site, Jesus was heralded in terms that could only be called messianic. Jesus is hailed as one who has come as a divine representative. Glory in the highest heaven, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Get it? He's heralded as, as a divine representative. We see that it is the establishment of the kingdom which is foremost in the minds of the multitude. Hosanna in the highest, of course, reflects the angelic announcement at the Messiah's birth, which is what the angels sang. So I am convinced that the crowds understood that day the actions of Jesus as a symbolic enactment of his identity as Israel's Messiah. And they welcomed him as the long-expected and coming one, Israel's delivering king, which was so awaited and so longed for. Which leads me to the fourth question that has to be asked and to which an answer is needed. So what is the underlying misconception then of these masses of people? Well, we're assuming that there is a misconception. And I will tell you, yes, there is. And so what is the nature of their misconception? Because they're welcoming him as their Messiah. Okay, very concisely. We're not going to spend time on this because we talk about this all the time as we go through the Gospels. What is the misconception of the masses? Well, to this gathered throng, this is all about temporal living conditions. See this? This is all about prosperity for them as people. This is all about freedom from oppression physically. To them, this is all about social turning of the tables so that the Jewish people are on top again. They're not underneath being oppressed anymore. Now, this is what we want. So this is all about reconstitution of social norms and rectifying that which is wrong in their eyes. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, it just was not the time for this. Which leads to the fifth question. That was the misconception of the people as they're ascribing to Jesus messianic psalms. The fifth question is, so what's the reaction of the Jewish leaders as they watch all of this transpiring? Because this makes it really complicated. 
Well, I'll tell you that they are appalled. They are frustrated because they can't keep the masses from going after Jesus. And they are furious. I want you to see Luke's description of the reaction of the religious leaders. Luke 19, verse 39 says, Some of the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Do you feel the seething heat? The passion? So they're astounded that Jesus is allowing this to happen. They think it's entirely inappropriate. The, cl the, cries of the, cl the cries of the crowd are clearly messianic, and Jesus accepts these descriptions. And the Pharisees react. How do they react? They say, do you hear what these people are saying to you? Stop them. It's not appropriate. And what is Jesus' response to them? It is brilliant. He says to them, and Luke records it in chapter 19. He says, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And what does Jesus mean? He's saying that all of creation owes its praise to him. And it will not be stifled. It will come forth. And I will not stop them. Which leads us to the sixth of seven questions. So what is Jesus' reaction to the way the crowd behaved toward him? How does he feel about what's happening in this complicated mess? Well, on the one hand, we've seen that he allows these messianic praises to be voiced, and he acknowledges that they are appropriate. But Luke records that something is wrong. The first hint that something is wrong is again found in Luke 19, verse 41. Luke records for us that as Jesus proceeds toward Jerusalem, probably surrounded by people singing and dancing and praising and reveling, he stops at a certain point and he breaks down in tears. Some kind of triumph, huh? He's sobbing. Why would you be sobbing when everybody is telling you how great you are? He laments, quote, if you had only known Jerusalem, people of God, if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. And he goes on to prophesy that tragedy will befall them because, quote, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Which leads us to the final question. Why does Jesus now allow such open praise and adulation when formerly he was busy trying to keep people quiet about it? Do you remember how many times he healed people that says, make sure you don't tell anybody what happened here? Remember how many times he, he told the crowd to stop, they would try to take him by force and make up a king, and he would just slide, slide through the crowd and disappear? How many times have we seen that in the Gospels? Many times. So why now is he letting it come out? And I would simply say, it seems to me that Jesus is now allowing this momentum to build, number one, first of all, because these descriptions and these expression of praise are both accurate and appropriate, which they always have been, but number two, because now the time has come for all of it to come to a head. It's so like Jesus is saying to himself, let it all come to the fore now, along with all the accompanying misconceptions, which will certainly culminate in disillusionment, in frustration, in anger, and ultimately my own execution. Let it all come out now. The time has fully come as he enters his Passion Week. Like I said, you see what I mean? What a confused mess is this thing. All of these different things are happening here. Rabid nationalism running amok. Joyful but entirely misguided revelers and worshipers. Praise is being rendered to Jesus and he's accepting them, but he's crying. Others are seething and they're making plots as to how they're going to kill him. And within a week's time, he will be dead. And then resurrected extraordinary. So here's how I want to end. 
what do you do with this jumbled, complicated mess? I would suggest three prayers that I'd like you to try to remember in the week that is ahead. First prayer that I suggest for you and for me, let us pray for a clear vision of what Jesus' lordship really means. Because so many didn't and so many don't. Many of us have an insufficient understanding of what it means that Jesus is Lord. So pray. Second prayer. Let us see beyond the allure of mere temporal empowerment and receiving social respect from people and having personal comfort and rather seek the eternal and unshakable kingdom that is described in the book of Hebrews. Because it's easy just to stay on those three things I've suggested there. Okay, and the final prayer that I would suggest for you this week is this. Let us ask God to grant us a stable and a non-fickle dedication to the Lord of all. Because in the course of a week, the crowds were singing a different song. Crucify. Crucify. He's not what we want. May we want the Jesus that is. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for allowing us to gather today because of Jesus. We are Christians. We bear his name. We are seeking to live our lives on the foundation that is him. We want our lives to look like his. We want our lives to bear his fingerprints. Oh, Lord, we are strugglers. We remain in a fallen world and fallen bodies with wills that are sinful. And frankly, we are a mess. We are that crowd. Lord, might you be glorified even in my confused, complicated life. Might the same be true of this congregation. We offer you this prayer and the ones that we've suggested for the week ahead in the name of Jesus. Amen.